Welcome to the MOOCs course in Organic Chemical Technology. The title of today's lecture is Phosphorus Industries, Phosphorus and Phosphoric Acid Production. In the previous lecture, we discussed about nitrogen industries and then production of different types of nitrogen fertilizers. In this week, we will be discussing about phosphorus industries where we will be discussing about the production of uh, elemental phosphorus, then uh, several derived components like uh, phosphoric acid, P2O5, etc. Uh, those things we are going to discuss. So, phosphorus industries basic raw material is phosphate rock, right? This phosphate rock available in the nature in the mineral form which is known as fluoropatite. This is having chemical structure Ca10, PO46, F2. It is primary source for phosphorus in elemental form and its many products as well, whatever the phosphoric acid, P2O5, etc., or uh, any other uh, uh, mixed chemical fertilizers uh, where phosphorus is also used. So, this phosphorus is a source for the phosphorus uh, derived uh, materials like you know phosphoric acid, etc. At present, whatever the phosphorus industry is there, it is primarily associated or connected to the fertilizer planning and production because whatever the phosphorus is produced, it is in turn again utilized for the production of phosphoric acid or other kind of uh, uh, fertilizers, uh, phosphorus fertilizers. That is the reason primarily phosphorus industry at present is fully tied to fertilizer planning and production especially in India. Thus, it had grown at the same pace as the nitrogen industry. Actually, we have seen that nitrogen is indigenous for any country because we are uh, getting it from the air, but uh, phosphorus and then uh, potassium are not available in many of the countries including India. So, mostly for uh, phosphorus and potassium we are depending on the imports, right? Despite of that one, you know this phosphorus industry has grown at the same pace as the nitrogen industry because of its importance in the fertilizers plants, fertilizer manufacturing which is uh, going to be utilized for the growth of uh, different types of plants. Phosphorus content of rock phosphate is expressed as percentage P2O5. Like in nitrogen industries or nitrogen fertilizers, what we see how much nitrogen that is total N is present in the fertilizer that is taken as a basis to grade a nitrogen fertilizer, right? So, here also phosphorus content of a rock phosphate is expressed as percentage of P2O5. So, if it is more than 30 percent P2O5 uh, is there, then we can say that you know it is a high grade uh, uh, rock phosphate, and then if it is having less than uh, 20 or 25 percent P2O5 that is uh, phosphorus pentoxide, if it is less than 20, 25 percent then we can say it is a low grade rock. It is also expressed as bone phosphate of lime especially commercially which is BPL, right? If you see the chemical uh, name it is tricalcium phosphate content that is Ca3PO4 twice. High grade rock phosphate that is containing more than 30 percent P2O5 is used for superphosphate production. Superphosphate is one of the uh, important fertilizers that is being used in general. About 75 percent of known phosphate occurrence in India. We do not have phosphate or uh, we do not have phosphate rocks uh, in nature, very few are there, whatever they are there out of which also 75 percent are having low grade that is they are having 10 to 25 percent P2O5, 10 percent is very less actually. If you have anything less than 30 percent P2O5, then what you have to do that or whatever you take you have to do the beneficiation etc. to increase its concentration so that whatever the percentages of a P2O5 is required that reaches 30 percent or more so that it can be utilized for a fertilizer production, okay. If you have a low grade ore, then what you have to do? You have to do beneficiation so that you can increase the uh, content of P2O5 up to 30 percent and then use it for a fertilizer manufacture. Major products of fully developed phosphate industry. Phosphate industry, fully developed phosphate industry, why we are specifying? Because we understand or we are going to see phosphorus uh, whatever is there, it is having in two form yellow or white form and then red form. This yellow or white form it is very reactive when it come in interaction with air. That is it ignites or combusts or burns immediately when it comes in contact with the air, 
right? So, its reactiveness it is very high. So, then uh, obviously safety wise it is very dangerous. So, one has to be careful. So, obviously even if you are producing phosphorus uh, in white or yellow form, you do not want to preserve in that form because of its high reactiveness. So, obviously what you try to do? You try to convert into the uh, red phosphorus or you know phosphoric acid or uh, phosphorus pentoxide and so on. So, different types of chemicals you try to produce because that is what having the major market because whatever the yellow phosphorus or red phosphorus that you are uh, producing that again you are converting to the other required uh, you know chemicals. Okay? So, all these things are done in one plant actually if not all majority of them at least three of them are produced in one plant that is the reason fully developed phosphate industry terminology has been used. So, often uh, you do not find any phosphorus industries where you may be producing only yellow or white phosphorus. Okay? In addition to that one you may be producing uh, red phosphorus, phosphoric acid, phosphorus pentoxide etcetera these kind of chemicals also. So, some of them if you see uh, elemental phosphorus is anyway one of the product then phosphoric acid, then ammonium phosphate, calcium phosphate, nitrophosphate, sodium phosphate and several types of other kinds of uh, organic phosphates are also possible. So, we know that this ammonium phosphate, calcium phosphates etc are also known as the mixed chemical fertilizers. Now, we start discussing about the phosphorus, its properties and production process. Pertinent properties of yellow phosphorus P4, P4 in the sense it is uh, having tetrahedral structure that is sp3 hybridization. It is actually having a white color, but when it come in contact with the light what happens it turns into the yellow. It is a waxy soft solid which you can cut using knife, right? but when it comes into contact with air it immediately ignites. So, its molecular weight is 123.9, melting point is 44.1 degree centigrade, boiling point is 280 degree centigrade, density in solid form 1.82 gram per cc, in liquid form at 45 degree centigrade it is 1.74. It must be stored under water as it ignites spontaneously in the air. It possesses pungent order like garlic kind of order with extreme toxicity. So, these are the properties of yellow phosphorus, some of the properties there may be a number of properties we are taking a few physical properties here. So, if you see the pertinent properties of red phosphorus which is also having tetrahedral structure, but it gets polymerized that is one tetrahedral structure of P4 another uh, connects with the other one and then it forms a kind of polymer. So, then it is a uh, red hard crystalline kind of material. right? So, how you can get if you heat this white or yellow phosphorus at temperature something like 250 to 450 degree centigrade for longer hours then you can get this red phosphorus which is crystalline and very hard material. Okay? Actually, it is also having tetrahedral structure, but it gets polymerized with different P4 uh, molecules, okay? whereas yellow phosphorus does not get polymerized. Molecular weight of red phosphorus is also same 123.9, melting point is very high 593 degree centigrade, whereas for the yellow phosphorus it is just 44.1 degree centigrade. This increase in melting point because this red phosphorus get polymerized and forms a crystalline hot crystalline kind of material and then density of uh, this one is also high compared to the yellow phosphorus it is 2.36 gram per cc. It exists in at least 6 different crystal modifications formed by heating yellow phosphorus to give a high degree of oxidation resistance and stability. Actually what happens this is immediately gets oxidized by air when it comes into the contact with the air uh, it uh, ignites immediately and oxidize this. right? So, that oxidation resistance can be improved if you heat it at high temperature in inert atmosphere uh, at high temperature for longer hours then you can get a, you know a material which is red in color and then it is having high degree of oxidation resistance and stability. Now, we see a few uh, basic differences between yellow and red phosphorus. Physical property, physical state and color if you see this yellow phosphorus actually which is white in color, white waxy solid which is soft and can be cut by knife, but 
though it is uh, in white in color, but turns into yellow on exposure to light. That is the reason it is also known as the yellow phosphorus as well. Whereas the red phosphorus is hard crystalline solid that is uh, lustrous in nature and then red in color. Order is uh, garlic like order, yellow uh, phosphorus having, whereas the red phosphorus is not having any order. Toxicity, yellow phosphorus is highly poisonous, whereas this one is non poisonous. Structure, yellow phosphorus is having uh, P4 tetrahedral structure, sp3 hybridization, whereas the red phosphorus is also tetrahedral but in polymeric form. Okay, different uh, P4 molecules are connecting and forming a polymer to give a very hard red crystalline material having very high melting point. When contact with air, yellow or white phosphorus burns immediately in air, greenish glow visible in the dark, whereas the red phosphorus does not glow in the dark, less reactive due to polymeric nature. Reaction with metals, yellow phosphorus converts metals into their phosphates, whereas the red phosphorus does not react with metals, however react with the alkali metals like sodium but at high temperatures. These are a few basic you know differences between yellow and red phosphoruses. Consumption pattern if you see in USA whatever phosphate rock processed out of which 18 to 20 percent is utilized for converting into elemental phosphorus. Major product from elemental phosphorus is high purity phosphoric acid which is used for uh, different purposes. It is produced in a whole range of concentration from 50 percent aqueous grade up to super phosphoric acid whereas in the super phosphoric acid you will be having 85 percent P2O5 which is nothing but 100 percent H3PO4 plus 11 percent free P2O5. This acid is primarily used in food and detergent industries up to 90 percent. End uses of elemental phosphorus if you see in India mostly up to 90 percent used in a phosphoric acid manufacture which is high purity and strength for detergents and food chemicals. Other uses include for manufacture of chemicals like uh, phosphorus oxychloride POCl3, phosphorus trichloride P2O5, red phosphorus for matches and incendiaries etc. Now we see production of elemental phosphorus by electric furnace method. Okay? So, we start with the conventional process of uh, starting with reactions, raw materials, bases, etc. So, chemical reactions, whatever the phosphate rock is there, fluoropatite that is in the mineral form that reacts with the coke and then silica that is available in the sand. We are going to use sand also for this process. So, this reaction takes place, you get P4 yellow grade and then calcium silicate and then carbon monoxide. Okay. Other reactions, you know, uh, if you wanted to get a red grade phosphorus, what you have to do? You have to take uh, this uh, yellow grade phosphorus and then heat it at about 250 to 450 degrees centigrade for longer duration of several hours to get this P4 red grade. Raw materials, low grade crushed phosphate rock, then coke as a reductant because whatever the fluoropatite is there that has to be reduced to P4 and then calcium silicate and then carbon monoxide. Then sand as flux. Quantitative requirements if you see basis 1 ton of yellow phosphorus with 93 percent yield if you wanted to produce. Phosphate rock you need 7.5 tons at 32 percent P2O5 to 9.6 tons at 25 percent P2O5. So, this number of tons 7.5 to 9.6 that depends on the what is the purity of P2O5 in the raw material phosphate rock that you have taken. right? So, accordingly you have to calculate and select that amount. Okay? Sand 3.3 to 3.8 tons, coke 1.6 to 1.8 tons and then carbon electrode consumption because electric furnace method we are using. So, electrodes uh, obviously is required, 18 to 25 kgs of carbon electrode consumption is there. Electricity for this process because it is electric furnace method, so then in the furnace high temperature is there around uh, 1400 to 1500 degree centigrade. So, obviously in, if you wanted to maintain such high temperature in the furnace, so then you have to give high 
electricity, cooling water 200 to 250 tons required, plant capacity is less per furnace, in a plant more than one furnace usually there, in some plants there may be two furnaces there, in some plants there may be 5, 6 furnaces may also be there. Per furnace you get 25 to 70 tons per day of phosphorus whereas 2 to 5 furnaces per plant are possible depending on the capacity of the plant. Now this is the flow chart for the production of a yellow phosphorus, red phosphorus, phosphoric anhydride P2O5 and then purified phosphoric acid. Right, these many are there in one plant usually it is there. So, uh, we take step by step what we do? We first concentrate on production of uh, yellow and red phosphorus. So, we take only this part of flow sheet and discuss now. We are going to discuss after discussing this one when we discuss about the phosphoric acid production at the end of the class. So, whatever the phosphate rock is there, fluoropatite that you crush in a grinders and then size reduce it and then uh, what you do? You add coke bridge, coke bridge is nothing but very fine particles that you get while uh, doing the coking of coal, right? So, then that mixture you take, that mixture of coke bridge and then crushed or crushed and grounded phosphate rock, take it to the sinterer where you do the sintering by adding some amount of air also. Why do we need to do this sintering? It provides the electrical uh, resistivity. Also, it avoids entrainment of fines because when this material, when you take it to the furnace, actually without doing sintering also, you can directly take it to the furnace and do the uh, desired reduction reaction of fluoropatite to get the phosphorus vapors and then you do the condensation to get the yellow phosphorus etc. all those that is also possible. But what happens? We have already seen this phosphorus is very uh, reactive towards the atmosphere. So, whatever the fines are there, so they should not be going out of the process and then they are also toxic. So, also you know one of the important factor is that you know technicians or labor working in uh, phosphorus industries for longer time they often get a typical uh, disease. So, that is the reason it is very essential to maintain or doing the sintering so that to avoid escaping of fines of P4 from the vapors after the reaction or before the reaction. So, that is the other advantage. So, first advantage is that when you do the sintering it gives the electrical resistivity. Okay? Also, it will avoid uh, entrainment of fines in release to P4 and then CO vapors after the reaction in the furnace. When this material you take uh, here in the furnace and do the reaction, so what you are going to get? You are going to get PO, CO and dust. So, here you do not want lot of entrainments like particles you want to be flowing down along the fused area so that you know reduction can take place effectively. You do not want the particles to be suspended on the top of the furnace and then they may not be easily getting reduced to the P4. Okay? So, that is the other advantage, two advantages are there of, uh, for doing the sintering. And then since you are talking about this escape of the fines etc. that you do not want, so then screening has to be done uh, so that the desired size of the sintered uh, material you can take to the furnace. Right? After doing the screening, any fines are there that you can take it as a fines recycle and send back to the sinterer to a proper size uh, enhancement by sintering again. Okay, size control is very much essential here. Okay, that is one of the uh, engineering parameter or engineering major engineering problem that we are going to see. Okay, size of the particle is one of the essential uh, part here. Now, depending on the size analysis, right, or not only based on the size analysis, but also based on the analysis of the phosphate rock that you are having that is how much percentage of P2O5 it is having. Based on that one, appropriate quantities of coke bridge and sand are added here along with the sintered uh, material, sintered phosphate rock. Right? How much quantities of sand, coke, etc. that depends on you know what is the percentage of P2O5 that is present in the phosphate rock. 
this mixture is then sent to the top shaft of the electric furnace which is having you know uh, 250 to uh, 300 volts requirement 3 phase alternative current power uh, electric furnace right here the temperature is maintained around 1400 to 1450 degree centigrade right the feed charge drops gradually into the fused section of the furnace where the reduction to elemental phosphorus takes place so that you get the P4 vapors and then CO gas along with that one some dust may also be there. right? So, here at the bottom what you may be having? You may be having the slag. right? This slag is very important by product. because it is often found to have ferrophosphorus. So, it has to be recovered. Okay. Sometimes it is important because of high iron content may be there based on the sources of the rock whatever the phosphate rock fluoropartite you take sometimes you know uh, iron content may also be there if the iron content is high. So, then all that comes into the slag. The slag that is the reason it is very important not only from the ferrophosphorus point of view, but also from the point of high iron content. So, then you have to recover them carefully and then use them appropriately. Okay? So, in the downstream of this uh, furnace what you have? you will be having a vacuum fan kind of thing. The furnace is maintained under slight vacuum by fans in downstream end of uh, the plant so that whatever the P4, CO and dust are there they can be comfortably removed from the furnace and then can be taken to electrostatic precipitator. Okay? Here in the electrostatic precipitator whatever the fines are there they will be collected and then sent to the waste dust fines etc are there, they will be collected and sent to the waste. Whereas, the P4 and then CO are there, they will be sent to a condenser where water is being sprayed. So, here this P4 whatever is there when it uh, passes through the condenser, what happens? It gets cooled and then uh, liquid yellow phosphorus collected as a product and then that is stored under the water because of the safety reasons. Okay? So, here you are getting yellow phosphorus as a product whereas the non-condensed CO is there that can be taken as fuel or sent to synthesis gas plant for the production of synthesis gas. Fine. So, let us say if you wanted to produce red phosphorus from this yellow phosphorus what you can do? You can take this yellow phosphorus in a batch converter which is a closed reactor operating at 250 degree centigrade which is having a total reflex condenser as well so that to avoid any escape of a P4 from here. Right? So, this uh, reactor is provided uh, with a jocketed system to provide cooling water because the reaction itself is exothermic and then that also you are doing at 250 degree centigrade. So, then proper temperature of the reactor has to be maintained. So, then water circulation is been provided to this batch converter, it is a batch reactor and then it is having total reflex so that to avoid going out of any of the P4 vapors etc. there. So, then they can come back because of the total reflex. So, this reaction occurs at 250 degree centigrade and then it occurs for a, a longer hours, you have to run it for the longer hours 6 to 8 hours or something like that. So, when 70 percent conversion is taken place approximately that is 70 percent of yellow phosphorus is converted into the red phosphorus, then this material gets solidified. Whatever the material that you have taken that gets solidified. So, after 6 to 8 hours of running approximately 70 percent of conversion takes place. Once 70 percent of conversion takes place, this material gets solidified that you can take it to a subsequent process of cooling, chipping out and washing with the aqueous Na2CO3 solution. Right, followed by uh, washing with water to remove waste solution, waste any wastes are there as a waste solution, etc. That you do it, and if at all unstable P4 is there, that can also be removed in this one. And then 
that product final product is taken to a dryer where uh, it is stabilized with a 1 percent magnesium oxide stabilizer dust ok. So, that you get the final high oxidation resistant and stable red phosphorus as a product here ok. So, this is about the production of yellow phosphorus and red phosphorus production from phosphate rock using the electric furnace method. So, whatever the description that we have seen through flow sheet the same we are going to see as a text here again before going into the production of phosphoric acid etcetera by the remaining part of the flow chart. Phosphate rock is ground and mixed with portion of coke requirement then sintered into nodules to obtain better electrical resistivity and to avoid entrainment of fines in released P4 and CO vapors whatever are forming after the reduction reaction in the furnace that is the advantage of sintering, essentiality of the sintering. Thus, size control is very essential and done by screening so that fines can be recycled to sintering operations. After sintering still if any fines are there you do not want to uh, take them into the furnace because they may be entraining in the reaction zone and then may not be undergoing the required reduction. So, those fines what you do you take back to the sintering operation for the recycling purpose. On the basis of analysis of phosphate rack that is how much percentage of uh, uh, P2O5 is there accordingly coke breach which is nothing but small particles in coking of coal and then sand are mixed in control quantities. How much it is required that depends on what is the percentage of P2O5 that is present in the phosphate rock. Then mixture is fed to the top shaft of the electric furnace. Electric furnace is 250 to 300 volt alternative current three phase uh, design with power fed to 100 to 150 centimeter diameter carbon electrode on each phase. This is to one electrode only. Feed charge drops gradually into the fused section of the furnace which is at 1400 to 1450 degree centigrade where the reduction to elemental phosphorus takes place. Furnace is maintained under slight vacuum by fans in downstream end of plant. This aids furnace gases move past an electrostatic precipitator to remove the dust. After removing the dust these gases are then sent through a water cooled condenser for collecting liquid phosphorus product. This liquid yellow phosphorus is collected under water for further processing or shipping under water because of a safety concerns because when it comes into contact with the air it immediately ignites. So, one of the engineering problem is that nearby this production plant there should not be any air as well or especially in the uh, zones where this uh, phosphorus formation and condensation is taking place there should not be any air. Whatever uncondensed CO is there that is in high quantities for example, per ton of uh, phosphorus production you get 2.5 to 5 tons of uh, CO carbon monoxide that can be used for uh, synthesis gas production after cleanup or it can be used as it is as fuel. Molten slag is also high quantity let us say for ton of phosphorus production you get approximately 8 tons of molten slag from the bottom of the furnace is tapped periodically cooled and crushed for roadbed gravel, soil liming and glass manufacture. In this slag ferrophosphorus byproduct is a very important component of the slag. So, then it has to be recovered properly. It is high value either due to high iron content uh, rock source or from uh, scrap iron slags added intentionally. It is sold as alloy steel additive and for weighting agents in oil drilling muds or oil drilling compounds etc. Yellow phosphorus is converted to the red phosphorus in covered batch converter at 250 degree centigrade. This reactor also containing a reflex condenser so as to retain any evolved P4 vapor because of heating in the batch converter. This reactor vessel is gradually heated and contents melt and slowly change to red phosphorus. When approximately 70 percent conversion is achieved this mass gets solidified. In this reactor heat control must be applied to avoid violent bumping because the reaction is highly exothermic. After a cycle of 6 to 8 hours the solidified mass is 
cooled, chipped out, washed with aqueous Na2CO3 and water to remove residual and unstable yellow P4. Then dried and stabilized with 1 percent magnesium oxide dust. Now we see major engineering problems. The electric furnace design must be done very carefully because the process is a electric furnace uh, process. So then whatever the reaction is taking place within the reaction is taking place. So the reaction zone has to be sufficiently large such kind of problems may be there. Okay? And then power and then uh, how to save the money by giving how much power saving you can do all those things are also needed to be carefully evaluated. Then control and operation of the furnace, specified quantities of feed has to come because of the percentage of P2O5 present in the phosphate rock accordingly coke and then sand should also be taken and then size of the sintered material is also essential. So, the control and operation of furnace is very essential. Safety in handling phosphorus because we understand the yellow phosphorus especially it ignites immediately when it comes in contact with the air. So, then proper safety precautions should be taken near the production and then storage uh, of this yellow phosphorus. So, we see individual details of these three problems. Electric furnace design, high voltage with a large reaction zone desirable to reduce the electrodes and transformer system cost for the same power unit because it will save the money. And then in addition to this large molten reaction zone is also necessary to ensure complete release of the phosphorus by the reduction reaction of uh, uh, fluoropatite within the electric furnace. If elemental phosphorus is only to be produced then exclusion of air is must. How are you excluding the air from the furnace and nearby the zone that is very much essential. Okay? Otherwise it will catch up the fire immediately and then explosions may take place. If phosphorus pentoxide or phosphoric acid are also to be produced at electric furnace plant, a controlled amount of air is added to burn the phosphorus vapor after it leaves the furnace and then this is what we are going to discuss now anyway under the title of production of phosphoric acid. Control and operation of furnace, changes in composition or ratio of blending of raw materials markedly change the yield because of the percentage of P2O5 that is present and then because of the size of the sintered uh, phosphate uh, rock. If you have a completely automated plant with uniform composition feed, then slag contains less than 0.25 percent P. If it is not properly designed and operated, then slag contains phosphorus content as high as 2 percent in the slag. That is not good, that can be taken as a loss. Safety in handling, we know that yellow phosphorus is uh, very reactive and immediately ignites when it comes in contact with air. So, then uh, it must be stored properly. So, most of the yellow phosphorus is converted directly to phosphoric acid and phosphates because of uh, its high reactivity. It is bulk shipped by tankage via boat, rail and trucks. Water is kept over the top surface to avoid direct contact with air since yellow phosphorus oxidized vigorously immediately. Shipping tankage is fitted for steam heating to 50 degree centigrade to melt the phosphorus before pumping. If elemental P must be used directly as in incendiaries and matches, conversion to less poisonous red allotropic form with improved oxidation resistance is required if you are producing only uh, elemental phosphorus. Now we see discuss about the production of phosphoric acid H3PO4. Pertinent properties of orthophosphoric acid H3PO4 if you see completely miscible with water and forms anhydrid phosphoric acid H3PO4 twice H2O in water solutions. Molecular weight is 98, melting point is 42.4 degree centigrade close to the one that yellow phosphorus is having, yellow phosphorus is approximately 41.4 degree centigrade. Boiling point loses water of hydration from H3PO4 twice H2O at 213 degree centigrade. Density at 20 degree centigrade is 1.83 gram per cc. Grades, technical, commercial, USP and food grades are available. Shipped in concentration from 50 percent phosphoric acid in water 
up to an equivalent 118 percent solid that is having 100 percent H3PO4 and then 11 percent P2O5. Shipping containers are made from rubber lined steel or glass from the safety point of view. Consumption pattern in India almost all phosphate rock processing is attributed to the manufacture of uh, phosphoric acid. This acid is then converted largely to calcium and ammonium phosphates for concentrated chemical or mixed fertilizers on site requirement. End uses in India more than 90 percent of phosphoric acid is used for fertilizers production whereas in uh, US it is only 42 percent for fertilizers, 37 percent for uh, soaps and detergents uh, whereas the 12 percent for food chemicals. Methods of production of phosphoric acid, there are several methods we take one by one. The first one is electric furnace method where we have direct conversion at plant site and then oxidation and hydration of phosphorus near consumers market. So, these two methods we are going to discuss now. Then wet process, this process accounts for two third of phosphoric acid production, whatever the phosphoric acid is available uh, in the market, two third of that one is produced by this wet process which we are going to discuss in next lecture. Here also wet process is done by two different ways, one is strong sulfuric acid leaching, another one is hydrochloric acid leaching process. Third one is blast furnace process but it is no longer competitive anymore, so we are not going to discuss this one. So, we are going to complete these two things now in today's lecture and then in the next lecture we will be discussing about these two processes. Phosphoric acid production by electric furnace process that is direct conversion at plant site. The chemical reactions whatever the fluoropatite mineral is there that is in the phosphate rock that would be reacting with the coke and then silica of the sand to give phosphorus and then calcium silicate and carbon monoxide. This phosphorus further reacts with the carbon monoxide and then with the air oxygen to give phosphorus pentoxide and then carbon dioxide. This P2O5 further reacts with water to give phosphoric acid. Okay. Raw materials obviously phosphate rock, low grade crushed phosphate rock itself is sufficient. Coke as reductant because when the phosphate rock get reduced to P4 LO phosphorus then only you can get the P2O5 from P4, then only you can get a H3PO4 by reacting P2O5 and water. Sand as flux, quantitative requirements, basis 1 ton of 100 percent H3PO4 in 90 percent yield. In addition to that 2.3 tons of byproduct slag if you wanted to produce. Phosphate rock 28 percent P2O5 you need 2.9 tons, sand 0.85 tons, coke bridge 0.5 tons, air 3600 normal cubic meters, carbon electrode consumption 8 kg, electricity 4800 kilowatt hour and in plant capacity 60 to 200 tons per day of 100 percent H3PO4 per furnace and then there may be 1 to 4 furnaces per plant. Now you can see in this uh, method if you are targeting uh, H3PO4 production rather than the red phosphorus etc., then electrode consumption drastically decreased and then electricity consumption is also drastically decreased compared to the previous process where we discussed about production of yellow and red phosphorus. So, now the process is same actually mostly up to the production of uh, this fines whatever from the furnace whatever the P4CO uh, you are producing and then dust etc. are there removing the dust from the electrostatic precipitator all that process from up to that point is same. So, rather now going for the condensation of vapor to get the liquid uh, P4 uh, yellow phosphorus what you do you take this approach. Right. So, now 
we are not going to repeat the remaining of the process because just now we have seen. So, what you do whatever the PO and CO mixture is there after removing the dust from the electrostatic precipitator that you can take to a combustion chamber where ambient air may be added in a controlled manner depending on the composition of P4 and CO. Then what happens this P4 get converts into the P2O5 and then this P2O5 if you uh, bring in contact with uh, water spray, so then what you can do? You can remove the acid mist which is approximately 80 percent crude acid, so then crude uh, 85 percent acid you can get. Whereas, if you wanted to remove CO, so when remaining of the uh, vapors which are not being able to removed by the water spraying, so they will be sent back to electrostatic precipitator from which you can remove the CO and then here again you get the crude 85 percent acid. This crude acid has to be purified. For purification three types of processes are there H2SO4 process. If you treat this crude 85 percent acid with H2SO4 then calcium sulphate uh, sludge you can get. If arsenic is present in the uh, raw material as impurity so then that would be there in the crude 85 percent acid also. So, then that if you wanted to remove what you can do? You can treat with H2S so that to get arsenic sulphides as a waste material and then if there are fluorides etc. are there so then what you can do? You can use powdered silica uh, material to purify it and then when you react them together this 85 percent acid and then uh, silica so then whatever the fluorides are there in the crude 85 percent acid they will be coming out as a product H2SI F6. Okay. All these three are depending individual purification processes treating with H2SO4 uh, powdered SiO2 and then H2S it is shown in one particular unit itself for understanding purpose but actually depends on the purity. Let us say in your uh, crude 85 percent acid there is no arsenic so then you do not need to treat with H2S. You have to selective, selectively you have to use them. If all three are then, then you have to do all three of these treatment process one after other to get the purified 85 percent phosphoric acid. Okay? This is one process. Next process is this one, so whatever the P2O5 is there that you can take to a combustion chamber where you provide bone dry air via silica gel and then whatever the P2O5 gases etc. are there, so they will be sent to a fluidized bed condenser from which CO is removed and then phosphoric anhydride P2O5 is produced. This is the other process. Okay. So, now what we do? We see the descriptive part of the same process. Uh, okay. Until phosphorus vapors leaving the furnace part is same as elemental phosphorus production part by an air combustion section a downstream from the furnace exists these vapors get oxidized to form P2O5 as we have seen in flow sheet. By spraying hot gases with water P2O5 is removed to form crude phosphoric acid. In this process formed mist is next removed by a scrubbing system to get a purified 85 percent phosphoric acid. Then this purification depends on the nature of impurity that is present in the crude phosphoric acid. So, for purifying crude 85 percent phosphoric acid following methods are uh, adopted. One is treatment with H2SO4 to remove entrained calcium salts as calcium sulphate and then addition of powdered silica to crude 85 percent phosphoric acid to remove HF and then counter current scrubbing of uh, crude phosphoric acid with H2S to remove arsenic as arsenic sulphides etc. So, depending on the impurity you have to choose the purification method. If all three impurities are there so then you have to do all three of them. Though uh, we have shown them in one unit you have to do sequentially one after other if all three are present. Sludge is removed in sand filter and acid can be sold as is or diluted to 50 to 75 percent grade because 85 percent uh, H3PO4 is very strong actually, it is very very strong acid. Okay? So, rather than further improving its purity what you do? You dilute it as per the requirements. You do not need phosphoric acid more than 85 percent for any of the applications, you need diluted ones only. So, then you can dilute as per the requirement of the consumer. Now, coming to the major engineering problems, 
two engineering problems are there in this uh, phosphoric acid production by the direct conversion at the plant site in the electric furnace method. One is the complete removal of the acid mist, another one is the material of construction. Because of the corrosiveness of the products that are being formed, material of construction is very essential. So, complete removal of acid mist is very difficult engineering problem, the several approaches developed and out of which two important methods discussed here. One is the electrostatic precipitator method that we have seen anyway uh, in this slide. Another one is the on the basis of the fluid mechanics, a system which includes venturi scrubber, screens and final water spray has been successfully adopted, whereas the weak acid recovered from the last two units is used as knockdown spray fluid for hydration of P2O5. The second method is uh, use of high voltage electrostatic precipitator, you do not need to do so many operations, only one, right? And then that also after the initial hydrating spray tower itself. So, obviously, because of this one, you know, uh, in ways the capital cost is reduced and then operational cost is also reduced, okay? So, that is the reason it has become more successful and then same we have seen in the flow chart also after removing CO from the electrostatic precipitator, whatever the acid mist collected that is the crude 85 percent uh, phosphoric acid and then that has been subsequently purified as we have seen in the flow chart. Now, coming to the materials of construction, furnace and combustion chamber areas are constructed by high temperature acid bricks. Hydration tower and other aqueous units are either stainless steel or lead lined steels. Electrostatic precipitator element is graphite to resist action of the free HF steel plant. Now, we see phosphoric acid production by electric furnace process, oxidation and hydration of elemental phosphorus. Here the chemical reactions, whatever the elemental phosphorus is there, that you do oxidation, then uh, you get P2O5. This P2O5 reacts with water to give phosphoric acid, raw materials, obviously elemental phosphorus and then air and then steam. Quantitative requirements, basis 1 ton of 100 percent H3PO4 in 96 percent yield if you wanted to produce, then phosphorus that is elemental phosphorus 0.33 tons, air 1260 normal cubic meters and then water and steam not definite depends on the process requirements. Now, this process actually is done in small quantities as per the requirement of consumer and because of that one, that reason these are far away from the you know uh, plants usually uh, away from the phosphoric acid plants. So, then what happens here? Whatever the elemental phosphorus that is there that is taken to a combustion chamber where bone dry air via silica is provided because this air has to be dry enough. Then uh, when it passes through uh, here, so then the reaction takes place, then when this reaction takes place the temperature rises to the very high temperature something like 2000 degrees centigrade, etc. So, the vapors whatever are formed are having a combination of uh, P2O5 and then CO etc. Here, so this mixture is sent to a fluid bed condenser where you remove the CO and then phosphoric anhydride P2O5 you get as a product, right? This P2O5 again you follow the same process. Again from here we follow the same process whatever we have seen in oxidation process to get phosphoric acid. So, once you get the P2O5 by this method, this P2O5 has to be water sprayed uh, to remove whatever the crude 85 percent uh, acid. If it is not completely removed, so then that has to be gases or uncondensed gases has to be taken to the electrostatic precipitator from where you can remove the CO if required, if at all traces are there. Otherwise, most of the acid mist is removed as a crude 85 percent phosphoric acid here. This crude acid is treated with H2SO4, silica, H2S depending on the impurities whatever are there and then those impurities are removed as sludges in the form of calcium sulphate, a arsenic sulphide and then you get purified phosphoric acid, okay? So, this is the third method, right? The same method description we are seeing. 
These processes are used mainly for uh, smaller customer requirement quantities. Thus, these are remote from uh, major phosphoric acid manufacturing facilities. Phosphorus is melted at 50 degree centigrade and metered by water displacement to a steam ejector and automation section of the combustion nozzle. Compressed air is injected around the steam automized phosphorus droplets and the exothermic reaction raises the gas temperature to 2000 degree centigrade. Entire chamber is about 1.2 meters in diameter and 3 meters in length. Uh, these are built of stainless steel with water cooled walls and then both vertical and horizontal configurations are available or indeed used. Partially hydrated gaseous oxides are treated in same manner as studied in previous method, oxidation method to produce sulfuric acid whatever we have seen where conversion of electric furnace gas to 85 percent H3PO4 occurred, the same thing has to be followed as explained. Purification is still required to remove arsenic via H2S for making food grade acid derivatives. Process modification to produce phosphorus anhydride. Burner designed is changed so that no steam is admitted and then by using silica gel or alumina fixed bed adsorption towers, the air must also be dried. Thus formed P2O5 after combustion can be condensed as a solid in large air cooled tower about 3 meter in diameter and 12 meter tall. Revolving chains clean off the needles which accumulate on the sides of the vessel. Also a new method employs self agglomeration on small spheroids of P2O5 in a fluidized bed operations. Condenser size is about 5 percent of the air cooled tower unit for the same capacity. So, this method you know having certain advantages. So, these are the modifications available in the current scenario, but anyway we have not discussed them here. Major engineering problem, combustion chamber design and operation for molten P4 feed required a great deal of development. Under improper operation a glassy type of metaphosphoric acid and its polymers can form which is not desirable product. These often drop to the bottom of the chamber which mandates frequent shutdown and clean out. So, one has to control the feed, okay. So, that because combustion chamber design and operation has to be done properly with a proper molten P4 feed. By placing combustion chamber near the bottom of a great deal of uh, meta phosphoric acid can be vaporized and passed overhead. So, this is one of the alternative if you cannot avoid the formation of uh, meta phosphoric acid this can be one of the alternatives to remove it. References for this lecture are provided here, but entire lecture is prepared from this reference book. Thank you.